Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. I've lived on three continents over the last half century. I've moved over 20 times. The longest I've ever lived at one address in my entire lifetime was nine years. I have a very difficult time answering the question, where are you from? Over the years, I have learned how to go with the flow and adapt the way I look, the way I talk, the way I think. My wife is from a very traditional con- community a place where her ancestors have lived for five generations. Thankfully, she has been able to accompany me on this journey with some flexibility, but there have been some casualties along the way. It's difficult to form deep, lasting friendships with people when you understand that you won't be staying there very long. It's a challenge to stay focused on the present and not look farther ahead down the road. When I look back at my life, and consider the decisions that I've made can be filled with regret, can be some thoughts of what would have happened had I gone the other way, but this is the lot in life that I have been given. Maybe I should explain why my life has been this way. I'm not military, although I think a lot of military families go through similar things. I serve in God's army. I'm a missionary for the Lutheran Church, currently living in the country of Malawi. This life that I have followed, these choices that I've made, it hasn't been something that I came up with all on my own. I know that. And that's very helpful when I consider the consequences of my actions. When I think about the friends and the family that I've left behind, there's really nothing that would make that worth, that kind of sacrifice worth it. Nothing in this world, at least. So I hope over the next several episodes of this podcast, if I even can finish this first episode, (laughs) to tell you a little bit about my current posting here in Africa and some of the adjustments that I've had to make since coming here. I'm in the middle of my life. I'm 52 years old, so I know that more of my life is behind me than ahead of me. More of my achievements are behind me than ahead of me, but I hope that uh, as I go through this, I'm not asking for your pity. I'm not asking for you to feel sorry for me or my wife or our family. I guess what, I, what I'm trying to do with this podcast is to help you get a clearer understanding of what really makes you connected to your home. There's an old hymn that says, we are but a stranger here, heaven is my home. I understand that very well in my personal life. And I'm pretty sure that the Old Testament patriarch Abraham understood that as well. When he was 75 years old, at an age when he should have been thinking about his burial plot, he received a vision from God and a command. The vision was going to make you into a great nation and bless all people through you. And the command was to leave his father's home, place where he'd grown up, his friends, his community, and relocate to a land far, far away, a place he'd never seen or even heard of before. You can only imagine what went through his wife's mind when she heard him come home that night. In the New Testament, the Bible talks about Abraham and Sarah and many other people as wanderers in this world, people who realize that this world was not their home, but they were longing for a better place. I certainly have those thoughts go through my mind quite often when I'm feeling that I don't belong where I'm currently at, I don't belong where I came from, and I don't think I'll find a place where I really will feel like I belong in this world. But I do know that there is a place where I belong, a place where I will stand with many other people like Abraham and Sarah, my family, my brothers and sisters, fellow followers of Christ. And that is what keeps me going every day. Throughout my life, I have been convinced over and over again that there is a divine plan in play in my life whose details I am not aware of but I can see in retrospect. Case in point, in September of 2016, 
I was attending a, a meeting of our denominations board for special ministries when I was passed a note telling me to call a phone number. I had no idea whose number this was, but I needed to stretch my legs. So I got out of the room and took a phone call that set my life on this current course of events. It was the chairman for the mission board to Africa Missions, telling me that I had been nominated to serve as a missionary in Africa. Certainly was not something I was looking for, not something that I had been asking for. I'd thought about mission work, especially because I had had prior experience living in Eastern Europe in the 1990s, but still, I was floored. And, of course, then, after the initial shock and taking the call and promising to give it some thought and prayer and hanging up, then, of course, you began to think about how others are going to take this. Well, call my wife, of course, first person, need to know. And I think that, in general, she was taken aback as well, but not necessarily in a bad way. I guess, you know, for for a person in my point in life, in their 50s, to receive the opportunity to relocate and live in, a, in another country and serve in the exotic mission field of Africa, of all places, it certainly was exciting. And I guess if I look at my personality, I'm, I'm probably more tended towards the kind of person that, you know, if given the opportunity to take a flying leap, even if it's off a bridge or a cliff, I'll do it. Not the kind of person who's ever really taken a lot of time to make up my mind on things. Other people, though, and my extended relatives are, are not necessarily put together the same way. And I knew that it was going to be difficult for me to share this news with my relatives, especially with my father. I remember very well sitting in the parking space in front of his condominium and breaking the news to him. And I remember his reaction, Africa, no. And I can't blame him. <laughs> Who wants to see their their fun flesh and blood move thousands and thousands of miles away? He had been through this before, so he knew what this meant for him. For my children, though, I think that was the toughest conversation of all. At the time, my two daughters were age 19 and age 17, just finishing up their secondary education or getting started on post-high school education. I'm sure in their minds they thought that they were adults, but in my mind, of course, I, I, knew, I still think of them as children. And I knew that this would not be an easy thing for them to hear, that their parents were considering moving away and leaving them behind. In essence, our move to Africa meant the end of their childhood. It was one of those watershed moments in life. Like when you take a call and you and you realize that nothing is ever going to be the same again because you're you've gotten the news that your your parent has has passed away or somebody you, you love was involved in a in a tragic accident or you receive a diagnosis of a chronic disease like cancer and and certainly I was not surprised by their reaction of my daughters to this news tears questions maybe even a little anger although they didn't really share it openly with me. I, I wondered, how would I have reacted if I was in their shoes when I had been at that age and point in time and my parents had announced to me that they were moving to Africa? In my devotional readings, I found some measure of comfort in these words from Psalm 71, 17 and 18. Since my youth, God, you have taught me and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. You know, these words were a good reminder to me that I don't have to be afraid of what would happen to me or my children or my those I'm leaving behind because Jesus has been with me my entire life, in my youth, and he'll be with me till my hair is gray or fallen out. And then, of course, that promise applies to my daughters and my parents as well. Yes, this 
may be the end of my children's childhood, but I know that God will be with them when they are old and always. And of course, that promise has been put to the test over and over again during the last three years that we've been living apart from them in Africa. Let me try to give you my perspective of, of the perspective of a parent leaving their teenagers behind while they go, while you go to pursue an adventure in a foreign country. Well, you do what you can to set up your kids, right? Find them a safe place to live with people who you hope will be able to keep an eye on them. But unlike the stereotypical helicopter parent, when you live 8,000 miles away from your children, you can't just jump in a car and swoop in at a moment's notice to help them out. And even though this is natural for all parents who go through the empty nest to let your children go and not be under your roof anymore, it's still very difficult for me and my wife. I think, no, you have no control over what time they'll be coming and going. You have no way to shield your children from squabbles they have with their roommates. And, of course, accidents happen. They happen in the middle of the night, at least in the middle of our night, because we're seven time zones ahead. You get that call at 3 a.m. in the morning, and you find out that your child has been in a car accident, and you weren't there to to help them through that. Or you miss a call from one of your kids, again, calling at some crazy hour in the night, and you wonder what is going on, what has happened. And, of course, money is available. Send up a good old wire transfer. That'll fix the, the car, take out the dents, pay for the insurance claim, buy a new car if needed. But money doesn't fix your fears. What about my children's perspective? I, I I wonder these promises of God to be with to be with us no matter where we go in life, no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, not having their parents around, they've had to certainly grow up faster, I think, than many of their peers. The peers are able to go home for the holidays or whenever there's a break from school, kick back and relax, go back to the to the house that they grew up in reconnect with their with their high school chums well, we didn't just empty our nest we blew it up you know there are many many times that i realized my life could have gone off the rails if not for god's protection i'm really beginning to understand the the stress that i put my own parents through by god's grace we made it through those difficult years and so i i trust that god will get us through this too Makes it hard, though, is my own human sinful nature. My own thoughts that think I can manage this on my own. God is kind of just there in the background to pick me up whenever I have a, an accident or to send me some help when I need it. Basically, <laughs> I think of God as being my, my helicopter parent. And I also doubt that God has got a good plan that this place that we've come to in life is ultimately not a mistake, but part of something that he wanted. My own nature, filled with worry about my children, and my, my nature, which can't see the future and is frustrated. But God has shown me the big picture. It's bigger than my current worries, bigger than my future trouble. I know that God's son sits at his right hand, and I am his servant by his grace. My daughters, they are his servants too. These truths give me comfort and peace. I think about how I've gotten to this point, this watershed moment in my life. It didn't happen by accident. It was something that God had planned. God is the one who chose that I should even exist. God is the one who gave me my, my faith, my calling to Africa. And I know that God will get me and my loved ones through this life and into the next. So when I am tested, I know I may slip up. But God will not let me stumble and fall away. And of course, the same is true for my children. They will slip as well. God will not let them fall away. 
he has them under his protection. So I've been talking about the chain of events that led me to cut the ties with my my family, my children, parents in the United States, and moving to Malawi. Those were decisions which I made under the influence of, of God, I know, but still ones that I was actively involved in the decision process. Sometimes you, you are given those those choices in life were between a good and a good, right? There's no bad choice to make, just you go this way, these will be the consequences, you go that way, and those will be the consequences. And you know that God will be with you whichever way you go. Sometimes you get to make those choices in life, but other times you don't. I chose to cut the ties with my children and my family, but but sometimes those family ties are cut unexpectedly. My grandma Grace died in 2018, just one month short of reaching the century mark. Of course, when you're almost 100 years old, you have a very small world that you live in. Unfortunately, her memory was failing, her eyesight failing, and a lot of pain. Living in a assisted care home, a nursing home, where they took care of her physical needs. So, so different from the person I remember growing up. To me, she'll always be Grandma Splash, the lady that we used to dunk in the pool when my brother and I were kids, who used to swim laps every day in her Florida home and invite kids from the church to come over and, and splash around with her. Oh, she was a lot of fun and huge, huge, huge influence on me. She and her husband, Harvey, great stabilizing factor in my life. So, of course, I missed the funeral because it was just not possible for me to leave my post and attend. And that was difficult. Her funeral was really the last chance for her and her husband's offspring to get together. The cousins were scattered across the United States, haven't been together for years. Most of them married off and having families of their own. We had a really special relationship with our grandparents because they lived in the city where I was born until we moved away when I was 14 years old. And we had so many Sunday afternoons, we'd go over to the house and grandma would have set the table with linen napkins and real silverware and and crystal wine glasses, things which were just not in my everyday reality as a child of the suburbs. We never really lived close to them again, although throughout the years, of course, made visits, talked on the phone, exchanged letters. And when my grandfather died in the year 2000, grandmother moved back to live closer to my mother in the north of the United States. And at that time, I was not living close by to her at all. And then I moved away even farther. And you, you think, well, you know, you'll get the time back someday. Someday you'll be able to catch up and make up for all that lost time. But you don't realize at the time that you never will get that time back ever. The time that you, because when you, when you move away, you, you know, life continues to move on for them and for you. I think that the majority of people in this world never move very far from the place where they were born right? I mean, even in the United States, once people hit a, a certain age, get to a certain point in life, and they're really reluctant to pick up the stakes and, and relocate. Maybe when they are finally at an age where they want, they can retire and move to be closer to their family, or the, the salmon has the urge to return to the place that it's spawned. But I'm definitely in the minority of people in this world. I've not only moved away from my family, but I've moved away from my country as well. And I've done it twice now in my lifetime. I don't know. Does that make me special or an oddball? Is it really worth the sacrifice? When I look at what I'm doing day to day here in Malawi, it's hard to justify the decision that I made to come here. Now, of course, I'm not the only one who left behind family and friends to follow the Savior. Twelve men were chosen to be Jesus' apostles. Only twelve out of all the people in the world. And one of them 
was the traitor Judas Iscariot. Only a, a fraction of people get to be foreign missionaries, and, and one of them is me. I understand that it's God's grace alone that brought me here. I didn't come to this because of my merits or my skills. And those apostles, well, they were a bunch of knuckleheads, weren't they? <laughs> they all were slow to understand what Jesus was getting at and arguing and fighting with each other over who was the greatest among them. And of course, all of them betrayed Jesus in his greatest moment of need when his enemies came to arrest him. None of them lived up to the title and the calling that Jesus gave them. It's no different for me. I know I betray Jesus. I know that I'm weak. I am underqualified for this job, and I am undeserving of the honor. And things didn't really change for those disciples, even after Easter, even after the miracle of Jesus coming back from the grave and showing himself to his disciples on that day of ascension. They were still thinking that Jesus was going to set up his kingdom on earth. Really, it took many years, even after Pentecost, for the disciples to finally understand what this was they were called to do. And then you think about some of them, like James the Elder. His apostleship was cut short by King Herod's sword. There are legends about what the, uh, the other apostles accomplished, stories about their travels and witnessing and ultimately their, their end, but those are uncertain. But Jesus knew the destiny of each and every one of his apostles. He called both Judas and James, knowing that their paths would end in places that neither of them suspected. I know in the same way God brought me here to this point in life, by giving me a Christian parents, although the home I grew up in was troubled by sin, like all families are. God used my, my grandparents to stabilize my home environment and to encourage me to continue on the path that I have followed to ministry and ultimately to service in the mission field. So I know it's hard to cut ties with your family, and I'm not numb to that pain. Not to my own pain, and certainly not to the pain of my family members that I've caused. And Jesus, he knows that pain too, right? He knows the pain of being cut off from his family, right? My God, why have you forsaken me? Because of Jesus, because his willingness to be cut off. I belong to something that's bigger than my my immediate family, or my clan, or tribe, or or my nation. I belong to God, and that's a connection that's built to last forever. In the next episode of Home Ties, I'm going to spend some time talking a little about culture shock. It's a pretty common phenomena that all people experience when they leave the country of their birth and experience culture and a people whose ways of thinking and behaving and feeling are very different from the ones that they're used to. It's not an easy thing to deal with. I've gone through culture shock several times, not only in the moves that I've made from my home country to overseas, but then, of course, coming back to my home country after time spent abroad and the, the phenomenon of reverse culture shock. It's, it's never easy to go through, but you learn to ride the waves, the ups and the downs, with humility and grace. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.